Good evening. God's peace to all of you as we gather with the angels and the archangels and all the company of heaven. We're told in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, as, they, as Christians gather for worship, they gather before all the firstborn that are before the throne in heaven, before all God's angels, of which tonight we celebrate and give thanks to God for St. Michael and All Angels Day on Sunday, but we observe it here tonight as well. Um, and so thanks be to God, we'll hear more about the work of God's angels and the tasks that he has for them um, in his church and in his creation, of which we give thanks. They join, of course, as we are told in the scriptures too, they join with the body of Christ as well in worship. And as, so as we gather tonight as well, may we do so with that proper reverence and joy and faith. As, as, as said, the angels are always offended uh, when unbelief is present in their midst, when the works of Christ are given. And so may we join with hearts and faith tonight as well. Um, you'll see tonight just a couple of announcements for us here. Uh, if you have your yellow insert, if you're looking at some of the announcements before service, uh, you'll note that dartball, the cornhole, that'll be starting up here in just a couple of weeks, October 8th. So looking forward to that. There's always a good group that gets together for that. If you have any questions about it, you can contact Jim. I saw him in the back there today, and you can raise your hand. Uh, Greg Grippentrog, he's our head elder. You can find his contact information on the board there. Uh, if you want more information. Uh, you'll see, of course, here a big thing to kind of bring up is October 27th is going to be our annual congregational meeting. Um, so just kind of let you know off top, that's still about a month away, a month from tomorrow. Uh, but just kind of keep that in mind, keep that on your calendars as well as we approach that. And as always, keep all the ministries and, and activities of the congregation in your prayers as well for our Lord Jesus Christ to be present in our midst as he is now with us this night as we gather before him. And so with that, let us stand as we are able, presenting ourselves before our King and our Lord and his legions that gather before him as we gather tonight for worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his infinite mercy, has given his only Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with our intro at tonight. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O you, his angels. Bless the Lord, all his hosts. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul. In peace. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, 
and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We sing our Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Everlasting God, you have ordained and constituted the service of angels and men in a wonderful order. Mercifully grant that as your holy angels always serve and worship you in heaven, so by your appointment they may also help and defend us here on earth, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation, please be seated as we hear from God's Word tonight. Our Old Testament lesson this evening, and also our sermon text, comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Balthazar, and the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine, and entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the twenty-fourth day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is, the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked. Behold, a man clothed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the voice of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. 
And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. He will command his angels concerning you. Bless the Lord, O my soul. The epistle reading comes from John's book of Revelation, chapter 1. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ is present among us this evening. As you are able, please stand as we honor him. As we do so, we begin first by praising him. St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, Jesus put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, 
I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man came to save the lost. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation, please be seated. We sing our sermon hymn this evening, hymn number 522. Lord God, to thee we give all praise.
Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, greetings to you and greetings also to St. Michael, the angels, the archangels, and all the company of heaven who gather here now too. For where Jesus is, there is his whole church, and so are the angels forevermore. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. In our Old Testament lesson, Daniel is told this by the Son of God. I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia, and I have come to make you understand. Thus far the text. What is today? Or I said at the beginning here. That's the first question for us to consider. Today, the church celebrates, it's often called, Michael Moss, where Christmas celebrates the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Michael Moss celebrates the ongoing work of Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. This work is happening now. God is working out our salvation in time and space. And there are allies and enemies in the conflict. And this work of our salvation in Jesus is the work that St. Michael, the archangel, the chief prince, as he is called in Daniel, and also all of God's holy angels are engaged in and assisting God with. As we heard in our reading, their work of our salvation does not go unchallenged. We learn, as Daniel does, that we are engaged in a spiritual battle that is ongoing around us and does not cease in this age. God fights the forces of evil that are opposed to the work of Jesus Christ, as we sing in our hymn, that would seek to devour you and destroy your eternal salvation. That is what the devil is at. And as Jesus put it, woe to those who bring sin, even to these little ones, it would be better for them if they were drowned and die than to cause one of these little ones to sin, who see the, whose angels see the Father's face in heaven. It is we that are being fought over. Michael is described here as the chief prince, the archangel, who in fact is set over God's people. And this means that Michael has been seen as the guardian angel of the entire church. It is this angel that Luther refers to in his morning prayer when he says, Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. In fact, in Christian thought, it is often thought that it is the archangel Michael who comes to Christians at the hour of their death to protect them and to also usher them through the jaws of the evil one and usher them into the arms of Christ. St. Michael's Day, it always falls on September 29th. And from here on out, St. Michael's Day makes us consider the return of Jesus and the end of this age. So because of that, the direction of our worship from now on until the beginning of Advent pivots. We turn from thoughts of this life, of Christians living here on this earth and this age, and from now on we begin to consider that of the life that is to come. Today, then, really begins to awaken our Advent yearning for Christ's return. And this now will all climax a month from now in All Saints Day. A month from now, just a little over a month. And so in the weeks leading up to All Saints, we're now being called to remember and consider that it is time for us to move on from this age. This is over. We cannot put our hope and our trust in our future here. This is at an end. It is time for us to depart, to enter into rest, and the glory that is ahead of us. That is what this day begins in us. But there are even more important questions that come to our mind, too, concerning our text. Questions that arise from our very curious Old Testament reading today. Questions like, who are these people? And what in the world is going on? And is this how it is even still today? So first, who are these people and these beings that are named in our text? In fact, to understand what's going on, we need to first understand the players that are on the field. 
The first named person in the text is Cyrus. He is the ruler of the kingdom of Persia, who is in his third year as king. Cyrus the Persian had destroyed and overthrown the kingdom of Babylon, which had destroyed Jerusalem 70 years prior. It was in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he had issued a proclamation for all the Jews to go back home to the Promised Land after they had been suffering in exile for 70 long years. The next person is Daniel, who was given his also name of Balthazar. It is this same Daniel who was thrown in the lion's den, whose friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace. Back as a, a young boy, perhaps no older than our compromands, Daniel had been taken into exile in the year 605 B.C. Daniel had spent the 70 years in exile, and now, in our text, he is an old man, perhaps in his mid to late 80s even. While his fellow Jews have gone back home, it seems that Daniel did not go back home, most likely because he was too old to make the trip back. Daniel, though, He's looking forward to the coming of God's kingdom. He knows from his prophet Jeremiah that at the return of God's people to the promised land signaled also a return of God's kingdom and God's king. It is this Daniel, then, that causes us to meet the third person that is mentioned in our text. Daniel, he is sitting by the banks of the Tigris River. One day he looks up, he sees a man standing before him. Now, this man has quite a description attached about him. We're told he wears linen cloths. This is what the priest would wear, the high priest. And he wears a belt of fine gold around his waist. His body gleams like a jewel. His eyes blaze like lightning. His eyes glow like a blazing fire. His clothing even flashes like lightning. In fact, his arms and his legs exude strength like bronze that's burnished. And we're told that when he speaks, his voice carries with it the roar of a multitude, like the sound of thousands of fans in a sports stadium when they cheer. Who is this? We're told when he speaks, his words cause Daniel to fall on his face in utter terror. His hand soon comes to Daniel, and he backs him up, puts him back on his hands and knees, trembling still, and he eventually tells him, do not be afraid. This being is divine. Who is he? Our Revelation reading tells us who we should be seeing him as. In Revelation, John is in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, when the voice like a trumpet blasts, summons him. And when John turns around to see who it is, which sounds awfully familiar like we just heard described, John says this, I turned and I saw the one who was speaking to me. On turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of those lampstands, one standing there like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, white as snow. His eyes, well, they were like the flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. His voice, the roar of many waters. His right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face, shining like the sun in full strength. John, like Daniel, too falls at his feet as though dead. But this same being that Daniel saw also puts his hand on John and sets him upright. And he too says to John, Fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. And that gives him away. This is Jesus Christ. And that is also who comes to Daniel in our text. Daniel gets to see the Son of God. This is the Son of God before he took on human flesh. It is the same Son of God who is now exalted and enthroned and glorified. God and man. And he has been sent to Daniel to give him understanding, but we'll get to that soon. 
there are also a few other characters named in our text. In verse 13, we are told of the prince of the kingdom of Persia. This prince has been opposing the work of the Son of God for three weeks. Daniel had once, the reason why the Son of God has come to Daniel, is that Daniel had been asking God for wisdom and understanding concerning a rather terrifying vision that he had received. But we are told that the Son of God was delayed for three weeks in getting the message back to him. So the Son of God contended with the prince of Persia, finally subdued him, and was now able to finally come to Daniel. It is commonly thought this prince of Persia is the devil or some other demonic spirit. He is called the prince of Persia. St. Paul will follow in this same line of thought in Ephesians 2 when he calls the devil the prince of the power of the air. You see, in the Bible, the nations of the world are controlled by spirits, and these are not good spirits either. All the nations of the world have been deluded and darkened by demonic spirits, who, and these people worship them. That's the pagan gods, and they conceal the truth of the one true God. You see, we always kind of think of demons possessing individuals, but in the Bible, demons can possess nations. We don't often hear this, but that's how the Bible would have us see things. Behind the rulers, behind the kingdoms of this world, are spiritual powers at war. Demonic spirits are in control of the nations of the world, and they are opposed to God's will and to Christ's church. And that leads us then to the last character that we need to name that is brought up in our text. His name is Michael. His name means this, who is like God? The Son of God tells Daniel that Michael is one of the chief princes of God's people. That's another word for archangel. Michael is described as the angel who has charge over God's people. If demonic spirits are behind the nations of the world, then it is the archangel Michael who is behind the people of God by Christ's command. We, we can think of Michael as the captain of the Lord's army. So now we have all the pieces. We know who all these beings are. Now let's put it together to understand what exactly is going on. Daniel has received a vision. Daniel is hoping that the time has now come for God's kingdom to come. Thy kingdom come as we pray. He's waiting for the Messiah. And he now imagines that the time, it must be drawing near for this to happen. But one night he receives a vision. The vision terrifies him. It worries him. He sees something that he cannot understand. What he can figure is that things are moving behind the scenes that he cannot possibly grasp. He suddenly sees that there has been a game happening around him that he is but a pawn of. He, when he was thrown into the lion's den, it was because there was a spiritual war happening around him that was seeking to destroy God's purposes in the world. But each time, as we find out in the book of Daniel, God had delivered him and his friends. This realization causes Daniel to mourn, to fast. He wants clarification. And so for three weeks, he refrains from food and wine, and he does not anoint himself as was custom and common to do. Finally, on the 24th day of this, which we happen to know the exact date of, April 23rd, 536 B.C., we're told the Son of God comes to him. That means that this vision was so distressing that Daniel did not partake in the Passover that year, which tells us that his concerns were rather serious. This divine being, Jesus, strengthens Daniel and encourages him. He tells him that from the very first day that Daniel began to pray, he was in fact heard. And because of this prayer, the Son of God, Jesus, has been sent to him to explain everything that Daniel saw. But for three weeks, Jesus was preoccupied. You see, he was in the court of the kings of Persia. Jesus was there to guide Cyrus into what the Lord wanted to have done. He was guiding world events. But his efforts to do this were being resisted. The prince of Persia was deflecting flames and desired to stop Jesus from doing what the Lord wanted done. And so Jesus was locked in combat by himself with this prince of the power of the air, the devil, for three weeks, almost like a chess game. 
You can see this, too, in the Gospels. Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days while him and the devil go head-to-head at it by himself. And you'll remember that at the end of the temptation, what happened? The angels came and began to administer to Jesus. We can see this spiritual war perhaps play out in books like Ezra and Nehemiah in the Bible. When the people of God go back home, their attempts to rebuild their cities, to rebuild their homes, and to rebuild the temple of their God are blocked at every turn. Like something, someone, is stopping their advances. No doubt, spiritual forces influencing the conflict. It seems, finally, that Jesus subdued this devil, like how Christ withstood the tempter and subdued him in the wilderness after 40 days. And here we're told that the same thing happens. The, Bible, the battle that we see in the Bible is a drama that's long been unfolding. When Jesus comes on the scene and does battle with the demons and casts out demons and fights the Satan in the wilderness, it's a battle that he's been engaged with for a long, long time. Jesus, we're told in the kings of Persia then, he finally has things where he wants them in Persia, right? The pieces have been laid and things are going in the direction that he wants. And so now he can depart and come and tell Daniel what's up. But if he departs, he knows, no doubt, the devil will find a way to bring everything back to ruin again. And so that's why we're told that Michael comes. Jesus essentially stations Michael and his forces in the courts of the kingdom of Persia, to hold down the fort, as it were. Much like how we have military bases stationed around the world so that we can respond to conflicts as they arise at a moment's notice. Michael, he is commended as one of Christ's great captains in the fight against evil in the world. His work is to aid Christ and his church. And this is something that we need still. For what Daniel describes today It is still the reality that is around us. The nations of this world still have spirits behind them that oppose God's work for our salvation. These devils are behind the ideas, the feelings, and even the mob activity of the nations around the world. They incite violence, greed, false religion, and false worship. They are behind the gods of the pagans in this world. But there is one who has come down to fight. His name is Jesus Christ. He contended with them, and though he could summon a legion of angels from his father, he instead fights the battle alone. And he has triumphed over the powers of the enemy. He says it. He has the keys of the devil's power in his hands. Death, Hades, are mere tools in Lord Jesus' hand now. And he is alive forevermore. And Jesus has been exalted above all the powers of the heavens. Jesus rules above every name that is named in heaven and on earth in this age and in the age to come. And he rules over all things, Paul says, on behalf of his church. You see, Jesus controls the nations of the world and he bends them to his will. And even when the devils oppose him, yet it happens to be that they play right into the hands of our Lord. Because their only real power, death, has been taken away from them. And that now belongs to Jesus. Jesus will have the final say over you, not your death. And so therefore, the battle has been decided. Christ has triumphed, and his angels assist him. And they assist us. As we gather today, they indeed join with us. They are here to contend with the devil that otherwise would try to pluck the seed of faith from your hearts. You are in the midst of a battleground. As you hear the word of God, believe it, are joined to Christ, and come in this sacrament to receive the victory that Christ has won. This is a battleground, brothers and sisters, so remember that. And so it's best not to offend Michael and his angels with irreverence or apathy towards our Lord. But rather, let us with our prayers join in the fray with faith and trust in Jesus Christ. To pray and thank God for the work of Michael and all the angels, to teach the faith to children whose angels always see the face of their Father in heaven. And then let us also take refuge in Christ. To pray for the leaders and those around us who are indeed engaged in a spiritual battle, whether they know it or not. 
Indeed, who sends Michael and his angels to the throne, Satan, and his hordes, and who defends his people, you, from age to age. May God continue to grant that victory to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now that peace which surpasses all human understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Together now, as his people, let us confess our faith with shouts of joy as we confess together the words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand as you are able as we confess our faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation, please be seated. Our offerings and tithes that we collected prior to service in the basket in the back, we now bring forward as we present them before our Lord as we sing the harvest hymn, Let the Vineyards Be Fruitful. enter into that fray of battle. Please stand as you are able as we go before God now in prayer. Almighty God, we give thanks for all of your goodness, and we bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, and for the lives of all faithful and just people and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us, and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy. Save and defend your whole church, which you have purchased with the precious blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Strengthen your faithful people through the Word and the Holy Sacraments, making us perfect in love and in all good works, and establishing in us the faith once delivered to the saints. Lord, in your mercy. Grant your wisdom and heavenly grace to all pastors and to those who hold office in your church, that by their devoted service faith may abound and your kingdom increase. Lord, in your mercy. 
Send the light of your truth into all the earth. Raise up faithful servants of Christ who advance the gospel both at home and in distant lands. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, in your mercy, strengthen newly established congregations. Support them in challenging times. Make them steadfast, abounding in the work of the Lord. And let their faith and zeal for the gospel refresh and renew the witness of your people everywhere. Lord, in your mercy. And preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead a peaceable life with integrity. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of this state of Wisconsin, and to all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Help them to serve this people according to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us a spirit of love and order our days in your peace. Prosper the labor of those who work to bring peace and justice to the nations of the world, that mutual understanding and common endeavor may be increased among all people. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we ask you to bless our schools, both in the church and in the state, in all colleges, universities, and centers of research, and those who teach and work in them. Grant your wisdom in such measure that people may serve you honorably in church and state, and that our common life may be conformed to the ways of your truth. Lord, in your mercy. And make holy our homes with your presence. Bless them with joy. Keep our children in the covenants of their baptism. Enable their parents to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion. And unite the members of all of our families here at Christ Lutheran in a spirit of affection and service, that they may show your praise in our land and in all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Let your blessing remain upon the seed time and the harvest, the commerce and the industry, leisure and rest, the art and culture of our people. And take under your special protection those whose work is difficult or dangerous. And be with all who put their hands to any useful task. And give them just reward for their labor and also the knowledge that their work is a blessing in your sight. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, by your word and spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow and need, sickness or adversity. Lord, we especially bring before you Alex, Jody, Kevin, Jessica, and Greg. Lord, with thanksgiving, we give thanks for Don and Dorothy's 62nd wedding anniversary that they celebrate next week. Lord, continue to be with them and all of our marriages here at Christ Lutheran, that they might be a witness and an image of your son, our heavenly bridegroom, and his bride, the church. Lord, be with all those we continue in prayers for, for Leah and Olivia, for Julie, Ardell, Allie, and Joan, Charles, Chris, Lane, Roxanne, Shirley, Amanda, Mia, Angie, and Brandon. Lord, for those who serve in our armed forces, that you continue to be with them and guard them and keep them and bring them back home, especially Daniel, Hunter, and Adam. And Lord, for those women who are pregnant, that you would continue to bless, guard, and keep them and their children in the womb, to bring them to terms safely, and to give them all that they need for this body and life, especially Lord Stacy, Samantha, Bonnie, Elizabeth, Andy, and Alyssa. And Lord, continue to ask for blessings upon your people here and scattered throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else that you know that we need, grant to us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing our final hymn this day. It's one of my favorites. Hymn is called Christ the Lord of Hosts Unshaken. Mm-hmm.